Well, let's start then with session eight, uh, Cultural Astronomy and Heritage. And I think that it's a constant session of this symposium. So first, maybe a couple of instructions for everybody. Uh, for the speakers, you know that you have 10 minutes, yes? And after all the sessions, we're gonna have another 10 minutes for questions. And uh, for the attendees, you can do your questions in the Q&A section. And for the panelists, you can do your questions in the chat section, okay? So I will going to revise that and make that questions to the speakers. Well, after that, we can, I think that we can start. I don't know if Nelson is here. Are you here, Nelson? Mm -hmm. Nelson Falcon? Oh, hi. Oh, hello. you're there. Hello. Can you can see me? Can you turn on your camera? Yeah. And ah. can you hi. share? Nicolas. Hi, Hi Alejandro. Hi. Hi. Can you share your uh, presentation, please? Yeah. I am Nelson Falcon, and my colleague, uh, the engineer, uh, Alcides Ortega, both the Astronomical Society and uh, Carabobo University. Uh, yes. Nelson my... now is going to present uh, a talk about the astronomical heritage of pre-Hispanic societies in Venezuela, total eclipses of sun reporting in petroglyphs. So Nelson, when you are ready, you have 10 minutes. Yeah. Uh, I can see your presentation perfectly. Yeah. Astronomical heritage of pre-Hispanic societies in Venezuela, total eclipses of sun reported in petroglyphs. Unlike other regions of Mesa and South America, in Venezuela there is no evidence of an ancestral material culture that accounts for the development of astronomy in the New Indian period. Close the Lake of Valencia, Carabobo State in the central region is Verdurina Archaeological Complex, the most important lithic site of Venezuela with an area of approximately 12 hectares. Characterized by the provision and variety of its rock formations, expressed through megalithic alignments, rocky piles used in the delimitation of spaces and above all by the existence of hundred rocks with petroglyphs in bar relief. It is important to emphasize that the great majority of the petroglyphs are of a naturalist realist type with a predominance of zoomorphic representations. The figurative features seem to indicate the importance of representing the surrounding natural world fauna, natural phenomena, etc. above that of the cultural world anthropomorphic representations and suggests a society with a close dependence on nature. Maybe in an egalitarian tribal organization, where the shaman chief priest would have had an important role as a mediator between man nature and the woman as a symbol of the reproduction of the human force of work. All the petroglyphs were etched in bar relief. The petroglyphs don't show remains of any pigmentation. The false black or white color displayed is a photo manipulation to enhance the contrast. The grooves could have been made with hexagonal quartz crystal, abundant in the region, whose hardness is greater than metamorphic rocks of the substrate. The cuts, grooves, and holes were made by successive drilling as evidenced by a half-finished rock found. Additionally, there are several petroglyphs with representations of simple geometric figures, points, circles, semicircles, and lines. One interpretation is their association with the sun, half moon and constellations, which could recall a possible and ancient eclipse of the sun. Using the big date in NASA eclipse website, we found only five possible total solar eclipses in the Neo-Indian period 100 BC until the founding of Valencia. A natural spectacle such as a total eclipse of the sun would cause, by its very unexpected and temporary nature, a need for communication and recording. 
A calculation of the astronomical position allows the contrast of the relative position of the planets and brightest stars with the apparent position of the Sun and the Moon during the eclipse for the geographical coordinates of the Vajirima. In several petroglyphs a notable point is represented near the eclipsed Sun. Only the eclipse of the year 577 presents Venus very close to the solar disk. Also, the foothills of the Tosto mountain range limit the topographic horizon and visibility of eclipses near dawn and dusk. Only the eclipse of the year 577 occurred at midday, and it just had Venus very close to the zenith. There was even a petroglyph with a hole through the rock, surrounded by a bar leaf and with a representation of a nocturnal bird. The archaeological complex of Vajirima is within the zone of totality, almost on the maximum line. The archaeological ceramic remains allow dating the occupation of the site between the 3rd and 8th centuries. The ceramic chronology and the stylistic analysis of the petroglyphs coincide with the eclipse of the 577 year. In the Venezuelan Andean foothills of the Barrena state, there also are many sites with ancient rupestrical art expression. All are petroglyphs in bar relief, without pigmentation in isolates of the other archaeological evidence. The extensive area under study covers the northern or Andean foothills in three municipalities of the Barrena state, around the Babumbum town. The petroglyphs in Bum Bum archaeological complex are not grouped together but rather scattered, mostly on streams and rivers, or in erratic blocks of the alluvial valleys in the plains east of the Andean mountain range. The Bum Bum petroglyphs present a greater profusion of details and a more elaborate abrasion technique, however stylistic similarities suggest that they were made by a rock winoid groups that migrated to the western plains between the 10th and 12th centuries. We also find astrological signs that could represent a solar eclipse. Is it the same eclipse that the Jirima saw? The eclipse of the year 577 was not visible in that region. Using the big data of NASA website, there are five possibilities. The Andean mountain range to the northwest of the region limits the topographic horizon and the visibility of eclipses, suggesting the total solar eclipse of 1378 is the only possible. This eclipse was especially remarkable with almost seven minutes of duration during the maximum. It occurred at midday with an altitude of 78 and with the five brightest objects in the sky after the sun and the moon. A phenomenon so unique and spectacular as a solar eclipse happened at midday had to have a mark on the collective memory and shamanic practices associated. The probable view of the sky in Bum Bum shows the eclipse at 1.17 p.m., with an eclipse lasting seven minutes at maximum and a temperature drop of up to 10 degrees in a tropical region. Such an unusual event must have motivated its imperishable communication and recording, with the only means available, engraving on rocks. The high yeah, frequency of representations of nature at a figurative level, level in comparison with the anthropomorphic representations indicate the importance of representing the surrounding natural world and suggests a society with a close dependence of the individual on nature. The stylistic similarity in the Vajirima and Bum Bum petroglyphs shows that they were made by ethnic groups of Iraq Winoid origin that moved from the basin of Lake Valencia to the Indian Piedmont between the XIV centuries in accordance with the ancestral settlement of Venezuela.
The contemplation of a total solar eclipse must lead to the need of communication and recording, employing the techniques and means at their disposal, the engraved rocks. We have seen how big data in astronomy also allows the reconstruction of ancient technology, understanding the archaeological significance and cultural heritage of a particular region. Thank your attention. Okay, thank you, Nelson, for your presentation. And now, in order to, to be on time, we need to go to the next presenter. And are you there, Siramas? Yeah. Yes, okay, I'm here. Can you share your screen? Yeah, sure. Okay. Okay. Yeah. You see my presentation? Yes, but okay, not in yeah. the presentation mode yet. Is it okay, yet? Great. So okay. now Siramas is presenting the talk Relative Orientation of Prasat in Nomrum Chuspika on the New Year's Day, the chief indicator for intercalary year. So you have your 10 minutes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so greeting everyone. I'm Siramas Komojindar from Chiang University, Thailand. Um, first of all, I would like to thank your organizing committee who make this meeting possible during this pandemic. And also thank you for accepting my paper. So the work I will present today is on the study that we conduct at one of the ancient sanctuary on the northern, northeastern part of Thailand. Um, our team, including me and um, Dr. Shosak from Chiang Mai University, and Ms. Arapin and Mr. Korakamon from the National Asimical Research Institute of Thailand. Today, I will introduce you about the sanctuary called Phnom Brung and the sun phenomenon we can observe today at Phnom Brung. The calculation of the phenomenon that could be observed from the temple during the 10th to the 13th century, the Saka calendar, and the usage of the sanctuary as an indicator for the intercalary year of the lunisolar calendar. So first of all, I would like to introduce you about the Phnom Brung sanctuary. Here's the map of our country, Thailand. Um, the Bangkok is, the, our capital is here and the Phnom Brung is 30, 350 kilometer northeastern part. It's around 30 kilometer between the, um, from the border between Thailand and Cambodia. Um, so the Phnom Brung mountain is built on the top of an um, inactive volcano. It could be compared as Mount Gailas as is the, the site is related to Shiva Hindu Nisum. Here's the the temple itself, so it's facing east, a direction that is believed to bring prosperity. There were the oldest construction remain in compound, which can be dated back to the 10th century, and the latest pass was built in 12th century. The restoration of Phnom Brung was done by an astelosis technique in 1921. The temple, which is of uh, east west orientation by 5.5 degree north has unveiled the astonishing phenomena explaining both astronomical and architectural interest of the ancient builders. The phenomena involve perfect quarterly alignment of the sun through all the 15 doorways of the Phnom Brung temple during April um, and September for sunrises and during March and October for sunset. Many researchers study the significance of this sun phenomenon, including the study of Mororov in 2007. He presented his idea that the sanctuary deliberate astronomical significance related with solar lunar event. He investigated the relation between the sunrise and sunset event with the vernal equinox and also with the total solar eclipse. In 2011, Komonchina concluded that there is no record about the sun phenomena, but there is a record about the relation between sunlight and the practice of the king. 
the work of Yano in 1986 and Rajani and Huma in 2019 are used in this work to compare other ancient India temples with Phnom Rung. Yano notes that determining cardinal directions was one of the first steps in construction temples in ancient India. He devised the orientation methods that were used into two categories, observing fixed star and observing the shadow of a, a gnomon. It is based on how the ancient intelligence used star in the zodiacal constellation to regulate agricultural calendars. Therefore, we hypothesize that the orientation of Phnom Rung is used to observe the bright mark star, and in our case, it's a spider. Thus, our idea is that it is possible that Phnom Rung not only built as a religious monument, but also as an astronomical instrument. Our hypothesis is that Phnom Rung alignment is used as indication for the New Year Day of the Saga calendar. Unlike modern astronomy in which the sun at the vernal Hinak marks the first place of Aries, the Hindu zodiac used the sidereal coordinate system that make a reference to the fixed star. Fata Kalenda based its year link on stars. New Year's days or present days, the columns of day in Thai starts from the moment the sun crossed from Minarasi in Pisces to Mesarasi in Aries. The first month is Chaitra month. The beginning of Luna Chaitra was to be on a day before the vernal equinox. In a leaf year, an intercalary day is at to the end of Chaitra. The original book of Hindu calendar is Suryasi Tanta. It was dated back to early than 550 AD, of which they might not have any knowledge of the precession of equinox. So they took the New Year day as the first point of Aries to be fixed. Spiker will occupy close to 180 degrees to the first point of Aries are virtually the vernal equinox during the first century. In this work, we wish to observe Spiker at as its rise or set on the horizon of observer at Phnom Room. In this graph, for the sun, rising and setting in 2020 are also included as well defined of a daytime and nighttime in which spider can be seen only some period of each day as shed in the gray area. The observable sun, uh, the observable one is only the cosmic setting in April, which also coincide with the Saga New Year days as the phenomenon sunrise. The orientation of Phnom Rung are coincide with the azimuth of Spiker at about 930 AD, which is matched with the first structure planning period. And the azimuth of the sun, about 100, 1300 AD, which all the structure were already construct. At that time, Phnom Rung was oriented with respect to Spiker such that the day Spiker set on the west side doorways at dawn would be the New Year day. The figure on the left oh, so yeah, shows the relationship between Spiker and the actual full moon of Jaitra, from which the intercalary month's year were detected. The right figure shows the relationship between full moon date of Jaitra month and New Year day. If the full moon of Jaitra month I try to year Y1 occur before the new year day, the next year will be the intercalary year. For example, in 2012 or uh, 2020, the calendar full moon was on the 7th of April. Here, the next year, 2021, is the intercalary year in time. So, in conclusion, we can say that Phnom Rung Sanctuary is not only built as a religious temple, but it was also used as an astronomical instrument for the calculation of calendar. So we would like to thank Chiang Mai University and Narit for their support and many people that advise uh, our project. This archaeological Research is an extension to the research conducted by Dr. Sumayyot 
in Professor Malika Tawan Ajiwas and uh, Professor Sanan Suprasai. So last but not least, I would like to thank all the audience for your time and attention. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much to you, Sirem Has. Um, well, let's start with the next presenter. I think that Steven is there. Steven, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, can you I'm share sharing my screen now. Screen? Great. Meanwhile, I'm going to introduce your talk. Steven is going to talk to us about astronomy of the Inca Empire. Can you so, see my screen? Yes, I can see your yes. screen perfectly. Yeah, I'm, so Steve Gal I'm Steve Galberg uh, at the University of Oklahoma. I'm the director for archaeoastronomy, astronomy and culture, and in the IU, the uh, chair for the working group for archaeoastronomy, astronomy and culture. And today, I'm going to give a brief look at astronomy of the Inca Empire. And uh, I found archaeoastronomy to be a great tool because it's uh, fascinating and it inspires people and that often can uh, attract their interest to other areas of astronomy as well. And I'll be using a few examples today to illustrate from my new book that Springer published in August, Astronomy of the Inca Empire, Use and Significance of the Sun in the Night Sky. Some of my screens will be both English and Spanish. Astronomy was an integral part of Andean mythology and creation, was at the very heart of the Inca's religion and agriculture. The Incas proclaimed themselves to be the children of the sun. They worshipped it and viewed their emperor as being the sun's direct descendant. The emperor Pachacuti, his son and grandson, successfully built the largest empire ever known in the Americas, 4,800 kilometers from Chile to Colombia. Incas learned the cycles of solstices and equinoxes and used this knowledge as a key component of their annual crop management activities, as well as for determining dates for religious celebrations. And the Incas also recognized dark constellations, the shapes of beings formed by dark clouds in the visible band of the Milky Way galaxy. They saw great cosmological characters meant to guide them in their daily lives. The dark constellations of the Incas stretch across nearly 150 degrees of the Milky Way in a section that is very prominent in the Southern Hemisphere. Most are animals that figure prominently in Andean cosmology and myth. And here is a painting of that portion of the galaxy that uh, my wife uh, created for me. And the creatures the Inca saw, uh, number one here is Machuquay the serpent and um, Two is uh, Han Patu the toad. Three, Yutu the uh, <coughs> Chinamu or bird. Yakana, number four, is uh, Mother Yama. And Una Yamaka, number five, is the Baby Yama. Number six is Atok, uh, fox. And then seven, according to Urton's uh, research, was another Yutu. And here is the Milky Way. And, uh, you can see from the Magellanic clouds, they point up toward what we know as the coal sack, but over here is the serpent and then the toad. And uh, I'm having trouble keeping that on the screen. And, and the mother Yama, the baby Yama. <clears throat> My own research I, uh, was basically based on six expeditions uh, with examining 31 sites. Uh, in and around Cusco, the Sacred Valley, and Machu Picchu. And I'll give some of my uh, favorite examples. Canco Grande, which is a site just north of Cusco, is a big limestone outcropping in the upper left there that uh, is at Canco Grande, and a whole lot of people can stand on top of it at the same time. In the bottom right, just off to the bottom left corner, there is a rock with a crevice that was created that casts light on the morning of the June solstice sunrise on those two uh, gnomons, first the left one and then the right one and cast a shadow to form the face of the puma. Uh, the puma being one of the <clears throat> three sacred cosmological creatures of the Inca, the condor for the world above, the puma for the here and now, and the serpent for the world below. Inside Canco Grande is a cave with a finely carved altar. And on the far side of the altar are, are the stairs that are shown in the lower right. And at the 
time of the June solstice near local noon, the sunlight climbs the stairs. It first illuminates the bottom and then the second and the third and then the top and then moves over toward the altar. Laco, which isn't far from uh, Kenko Grande, has three caves with interesting astronomical uh, orientations. This is the southwest cave. I'm standing inside it where a loof where a light tube is pointing at an altar, and I'm looking outward and photographing the crescent moon crossing the path <coughs> that is um, denoted by the light tube. In the northeast cave, the uh, opening is exactly situated for the June solstice sunrise. And here, the sun will come morning by morning, getting closer and closer from the right. It'll stop there uh, at the standstill dead center on the cave opening. And, and in the lower right, illuminate the altar and the reflection illuminates the rest of the cave. And then, of course, after the uh, solstice, the sunrise starts moving back toward the right again. And the third cave, the southeast cave, is a multi-chamber cave. And the inner chamber has an another finely carved altar, this one with a light tube above it that's oriented at the time of the zenith sun in the, in the tropics in Cusco. That's, of course, twice a year. And, uh, and the... Uh, name for this is the Temple of the Moons. They also had used it for lunar ceremonies as well. Waka 44 is not far from both of those. And in the lower right, you can see a large circle and a smaller circle and the tangential lines drawn between them uh, point to where to look on the horizon for the major solar horizon events. The June solstice sunrise, December solstice sunset, December solstice sunrise, June solstice sunset, and the equinox sunrise and sunset. In the lower right, you can see at the bottom of the picture, the big circle, the small circle, the line between them pointing to the June solstice sunrise. Kespiwanka pillars, uh, the Spanish chronic chroniclers recorded that there were 16 towers once in the Cusco horizon. They're all gone now, um, but two still exist above the palace of Huanacapac at uh, the modern village of Urubamba. And this um, large granite boulder that sat in the center of the palace courtyard is the uh, central focal point for this exercise. There's the two pillars up on the Sarasewa Ridge above Kespiwanka. And in the left picture there, this is approaching the June solstice. The sun is rising over the right tower and it'll continue to move toward the left tower as the solstice arrives. Oyente Tambo has the uh, Pumatias uh, terraces that face out uh, toward the December solstice sun and the opposite direction face toward frame nicely the June solstice sunset. Then Masano within Oyente Tambo has some uh, horizontal gnomons and they with some notches beneath them. And at the time of the December solstice near local noon, the uh, shadows from the gnomons come down and fill the one notch there in the lower uh, picture that's on the left. And formerly it would have fit, filled a second notch on the right, but that has been eroded away. So when we got onto Machu Picchu and here on the left, you can see the sun temple of Yaktapada and in the gorge below in the middle of the river in Tiwatana and then Machu Picchu and its sacred plaza on the right, and they all are on the axis of the June solstice sunrise, December solstice sunset. And here is um, a very iconic view of Machu Picchu, but I point it out because here where my arrow is pointing is the sacred plaza. And there's the sacred plaza on the left. And uh, like I said, it's on the axis for the June solstice sunrise, December solstice sunset, and that's the June solstice sun rising over it from the Machu Picchu and Iwatana in the distance, five kilometers, that's the Yaktapata Ridge. And there's over a hundred structures uh, embedded in the cloud forest there. Stephen, you have two minutes left, okay? okay. And the, one of them is the Yaktapata Sun Temple. It's the one that's still kept clear um, at, at Yaktapata. And here in, in this photo, the kind of the primary entrance for the Sun Temple, I point out my, where our feet are, the beginning of a stone channel. And in the lower right here, that channel you can see is aimed at the sacred plaza of Machu Picchu and the June solstice sunrise above it. And it is thought that the Incas poured sacred fluids there to energize the sun so that in June, in the winter, as the sun got lower and lower, that it would be energized and it would rise again. 
and there's the sunrise. There's the river in Iwatana down deep in the gorge below. And uh, you know, I did my research there. Uh, the Intiwatani you can see is off toward the right, and there's some of the other structures that were around it. So once again, here's uh, Machu Picchu region, and the, you can see Machu Picchu, the river in Iwatana, the Sun Temple, they're all on that axis of the June solstice sunrise, December solstice sunset. So the Incas certainly had many examples of astronomy in their culture, light and shadow effects throughout the year. And of the eight primary solar horizon events, those that most prominent were for June solstice sunrise and December solstice sunrise. And two of the Incas primary festivals occurred at those times. Um, just point out quickly, if anyone knows of anyone with more interest in archaeoastronomy, that my university has a program now for archaeoastronomy and astronomy and culture. We've got uh, currently six graduate level courses and are about to launch five undergraduate courses. And these are all online, so anyone can take them anywhere. And if you want to just read more about Inca astronomy, of course, my book that I mentioned is there. And uh, my wife, Jessica, the artist, did 31 paintings, drawings, and maps for me. This is her painting of the Machu Picchu night sky, and those stars are accurately placed. So with that, I will conclude. And then uh, when the time comes, if you have any questions, please ask. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for your time, Stephen. Stay there, because at the end of the session, maybe you have some questions, OK? OK, and I will um, stop my screen share for you. Yes, OK. And our next speaker is going to be uh, Gore. Are you there? Yeah, yeah. Hello, hi. Uh, uh, I apologize for that. I don't have access to the web camera right now. Uh, but oh, it's, it's no problem. Can you share your presentation now? Yeah, can you see that? OK, perfect. So Gore is going to present Armenian Astronomical Heritage and Big Data. So Gore, if you go there, in presentation mode, you have now your 10 minutes, OK? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I am Gore Mikhailian. I am a PhD student at uh, Burakan Astrophysical Observatory from Armenia. Uh, so let's start. Uh, Armenia is one of the cradles of ancient science and astronomical knowledge was developed in ancient Armenia as well. Contrary to its small territory and relatively small population, Armenia was and is rather active in astronomy. Astronomy in Armenia was popular since ancient times. There are signs of astronomical observations coming from a few thousand years ago. Among the astronomical activities that have left their traces in the territory of Armenia are the rock art, ruins of ancient observatories, the ancient Armenian calendar, astronomical terms and names used in Armenian language since the second millennia BC, sky maps from Middle Ages, and most important, one of the largest modern observatories in the region, the Burakan Astrophysical Observatory with its 2.6 meter and one meter Schmidt telescopes. Studies of the Armenian rock art present in the territory of modern Armenia show that the Armenians were interested in heavenly bodies and phenomena. The Earth, the Sun, the Moon, planets, comets, Milky Way, stars, constellations are reflected in these pictures drawn on rocks in mountains around Lake Sevan and elsewhere in Armenia. According to investigations by Badalian, Tumanyan and Brutian, the Armenian calendar was one of the most ancient in the world. Armenians used lunar, then lunar solar calendar, and since mid the first millennium BC, they changed to solar calendar, which contained 365 days, 12 months by 30 days, and an additional month of five days. The new year began in Navasart, corresponding to August 11, when the grape harvest was underway and the constellation Orion became visible in the night sky. Together with the months, all days of any month also had proper names. The year 2492 BC was adopted as the beginning. The Armenian great calendar was introduced in sixth century and the difference with the Julian one was recalculated. It is remarkable that the Markarians from Venice are the oldest publishers of the Armenian and world calendars since 1775. One of the most remarkable scientists in the middle ages was Ananya Shirakatsi who had rather progressive astronomical ideas for those times. He has left a few books and writings that survived up to nowadays. Ananya Shirakatsi knew about the spherical shape of the Earth. He accepted also that the Milky Way consisted of numerous faint stars, could correctly interpret lunar and solar eclipses, and had a number of other progressive astronomical knowledge for that time. 
Ananya Shirakatsi's works serve as the main source for establishing the ancient Armenian astronomical terminology, including the names of constellations and stars. According to Professor Pskovsky, the 1054 supernova was first seen and recorded in Armenia in May 1054, only later in summer in China. Interestingly, its remnant, the famous Crab Nebula, has been studied in detail in the Burakan Astrophysical Observatory and was one of its famous objects of investigation. Hukas Vanandetsi and Mkhitar Sebastatsi lived and worked in Europe in 17th, 18th centuries and are known for their detailed charts of the heavens. Lukas Vanandetsi made astronomical instruments, published the first sky chart with Armenian names of constellations in Amsterdam at the beginning of 18th century. Mkhitar Sebastati was the person who founded the Armenian Catholic Church community in St. Lazar Island near Venice, a touristic site for many visitors. The modern astronomy in Armenia begins with the foundation of the Burakan Astrophysical Observatory. It is one of the most important astronomical centers in Eastern Europe and Middle East region, both by its scientific instruments and achievements. The observatory was founded in 1946 on the initiative of Viktor Ambarsumyan. The main scientific instruments at BAU are 2.6 meter telescope, one meter and half meter Schmidt telescopes. Being one of the largest telescopes in European, Asian, and African region, the Burakan 2.6 meter telescope allows to make detailed spectral, photometric, and other investigations of interesting faint objects. The 2.6 meter telescope was installed in 1975 and is in operation since 1976. It is a classical Cassegrain system telescope. During 1976-1991, the primary observations have been carried out on the morphological study of Markarian galaxies, investigation of star clusters, groups, and clusters of galaxies. The observed 5,000 slit spectra on this telescope are of stellar objects of the first Burakan survey, T-Tau and flare stars objects of the second Burakan survey. During the observations of 1996-2007, new interesting results have been obtained. Faint objects in a one degree field are being observed to find high redshift primordial galaxies. Hundreds of IRAs and SBS galaxies, as well as many non-stable stars and young stellar objects have been studied spectroscopically. A systematic search for emission line objects is being carried out with the 2.6 meter telescope too. <clears throat> The Burakan Astrophysical Observatory 1 meter Schmidt telescope is one of the largest Schmidt type telescopes in the world and one of the most efficient astronomical telescopes in general. The telescope was installed in 1916, the main territory of the Burakan Observatory. One of the 1 meter Schmidt telescope's advantages was the presence of its three objective prisms, which made possible wide field spectroscopic observations with various dispersions. The objective prism can rotate in the position angle that allows obtaining spectra of any orientation. <clears throat> the first Burakan survey is the most famous work done with this telescope. More than 2000 photographic plates were obtained. 1500 objects were selected, which are known at present as Markarian galaxies. The survey involved the largest ever astronomical study of the nearby universe and is considered one of the most important achievements of 20th century astrophysics. In 2011, the first Burakan survey has been included in UNESCO's Memory of the World International Register. The digitized first Burakan survey is the digitized version of the first Burakan survey. It is the largest spectroscopic database in the world providing low dispersion spectra for 20 million objects. The FBS is a joint project of the Burakan Astrophysical Observatory, Cornell University, and Universita di Roma La Sapienza. The DFBS has been created in 2002-2003 as a result of digitization and reduction of 1,874 FBS plates. <clears throat> High accuracy astrometric solution has been made for each plate. At present, all plates have astrometric solution. The typical RMS accuracy is one arc second. Dedicated software allows quick access to any field by given position and extraction of the needed spectra, their calibration, classification, and study. The DFBS is free for the astronomical community. DFBS is the largest Armenian astronomical database and one of the largest in the world. Burakan Astrophysical Observatory Plate Archive is one of the largest astronomical archives and is considered to be our main observational treasure. Taking into account decades hard work of Armenian astronomers and the work of BAO telescopes, as well as the results of their activities, we can say that BAO Plate Archive is one of our national scientific values. 
Due to Victor Ambarsman's brilliant ideas and the mentioned observational work, the Armenian government has recognized Bao as national value. Today, Bao Archive holds about 37,000 astronomical plates, films, or other carriers of observational data. The digitization project is aimed at compilation, accounting, digitization of Bao observational archive photographic plates and films, as well as their incorporation in databases with modern standards and methods, providing access for all observational material and development of new scientific programs based on this material. The electronic well, archive yeah. More please take into contact. You have two minutes left, okay? Okay, okay. This is my last slide, I think. The electronic archive will be a part of the Armenian Virtual Observatory and hence will be incorporated in the International Virtual Observatories Alliance. And at the end, I would like to mention that this year on September, the International Symposium Astronomical Service and Big Data 2 took place in the Burakan Astrophysical Observatory. This was the second such meeting. First one was in tw uh, 2015. Both of them were very successful with participation of astronomers and computer scientists. We combined astronomers and computer scientists with heavy involvement of astronomical service, catalogs, archives, databases, and virtual observatories. Thank you for your attention. Well, great. Thank you to you, Gore. All the oral presenters here are sticking to their times uh, very well. So next talk is by Duruti. Duruti, are you there? I'm here. Okay, great. Can I, you start I, your presentation? Great, so Duruti is going to tell us about Cultural Astronomy in Guadalajara, Mexico, from textbooks to artistic issues. Well, uh, this work was developed for, uh, by Monica Martinez Borrallo, my partner and wife, from the Secretaría de Cultura of, of Jalisco State Government and myself. The outline is from CAP to NASA and Cultural Astronomy, Old Books and Astronomy in the City, Astronomy in Artistic Issues and Preserving Astronomical Heritage. Now, uh, Monica. I'm sorry. The Cultural Astronomy is a theoretical proposal to do social research in the context of the cultural production. This talk, we recover some of them in the case of Guadalajara, Mexico, from the centuries in the 19th century and uh, 20th uh, century, for example. And uh, uh, this uh, be began at uh, Fukuoka in the communication of astronomy uh, to the public um, uh, that we meet the, the subject of uh, uh, cultural astronomy and astronomical heritage. In the uh, board to propose uh, on conference uh, subjects, we put just uh, preserving and communicating astronomical heritage that, that was a uh, big uh, acceptance there and uh, we, we also meet uh, uh, the NASA workshops with uh, Professor Tomita here and of course uh, uh, Beatriz and uh, next uh, discussion well here is my presentation on uh, some issues on the history of astronomy in Guadalajara that we, we see here the uh, Sacrobosco uh, diagram concerning uh, solar eclipses. And uh, uh, the next step was in Vienna in the occasion of the second NASA seminar uh, where was uh, presented the, the book uh, uh, Kaleidoscope in Cultural Astronomy by, by Rosa. Uh, also here, and uh, it began the, the subject on uh, heritage of, of astronomy, 
that uh, in the case of Guadalajara, we, we follow through books mainly because uh, one of uh, these uh, curious uh, uh, books is the, the masterpiece of the, the Revolutionibus Orbium Colestium Libri Sex by Nicolaus Copernicus. And uh, that, that was recovered and is uh, part of the memory of the work by UNESCO. And in Jalisco, we have the only copy of the first edition of the Revolutionibus. And uh, this copy has some annotation that su suggests us the, some relation with textbook writing. Uh, and the, it's not censored and fully annotated. Another old books that we have in Jalisco is uh, uh, mentioned Sacrobosco Sfera Mundi. That is not first edition, but is Incunabulus. Um, that uh, tell us uh, on the interest of astronomy in the uh, uh, Guadalajara uh, at the colonial er era. Well, this is the uh, Sacrobosco's uh, pages concerning eclipses that now the, you will have a wonderful eclipse there in Chile and Argentina. And all other curious books that we have are the Peter Apianus Cosmographia. Then we try to recover the practices concerning astronomy through the titles of the books and the other uh, um, objects. And uh, we asked, uh, we, where is the astronomy present in the city? Well, we are in Guadalajara, Mexico. That is the second largest city of the country, just northern of the uh, main uh, lake in Mexico, that is Chapala Lake. We are here, number one, Guadalajara. And uh, in on old map of 8084, that show us the, this Guadalajara and some places like the main cathedral, uh, the, the main theater, the Goyado theater that uh, we, we discuss uh, near. And here is cathedral in, in, the, in the row. And uh, the, sorry, a cathedral and the San Francisco temple that are related with the next image that is from 8082. Uh, taken by the Campanile Tower of uh, San Francis uh, Church. And perhaps here was the first professional uh, astronomical observatory in Guadalajara that was uh, led by uh, Gabriel Castaños uh, in their own uh, house and uh, his nephew, uh, Carlos uh, Fernando de Landero, that uh, in such a uh, observatory uh, determined the longitude of Guadalajara and also observed the 8082 uh, transit of Venus. Ha as we see here, it was a uh, note has Observatorio Astronomical de Guadalajara, Guadalajara's Astronomical Observatory. And uh, then in uh, February 2, 8089, uh, the uh, state governor, Ramon Corona, give a go, uh, govern report that uh, soon will, will be open the Observatorio Astronomico and, Meteorolo and e Meteorologico that uh, unfortunately uh, was not seen by him because he was uh, murdered in uh, November 11 of such year. The April Two of 1882 was opened the Observatorio Astronomico y Meteorológico del Estado that was established in the uh, engineers' school at the old Colegio de San Juan of the Jesuits. Uh, this is the uh, modern uh, view of uh, such place, and this is a diagram that uh, should uh, could be this uh, first uh, uh, place of uh, such observatory by the 80. By, by, by the 1894, the observatory was moved uh, and was part of uh, news in the newspapers of public observations. Then in 1894, uh, have a new uh, place 
in, outside the city. This is uh, the, the new place of such observatory where is uh, this telescope that still exists and also all buildings still exist that uh, was uh, di directed by uh, uh, Priest, uh, Severo Diaz Galindo, uh, as a director, when the observatory became become part of the Universidad of Guadalajara. Uh, another, yes. You have two minutes, okay? Well, uh, uh, we saw uh, uh, first uh, the, the ancient uh, seminary that had also an observatory, at the places where uh, was uh, developed astronomy in Guadalajara. And some of the words that are shown here, uh, 1942, the end of Guadalajara, 1947, observatory changed name, and a uh, movie of the Gold Airs uh, shows this uh, view of the observatory, a modern view uh, with the popular observatory, 16th view of the observatory, and uh, another images of the observatory, and it was when we uh, had the Nazi worship. Monica. Okay, the Apollo legends uh, tells that Ascent Olympus was the humanus ones, and Ons good was not only of the lack of the home, but also of the science. This still attributes uh, around light and an allegory of planets. Here is a- uh, uh, Urania in the Tierra de Goyado. Uh, for the author is um, Roberto Montenegro, the painter uh, uh, the Zodiac, and the uh, mural the Fiesta de Santa Cruz uh, missing. Uh, this is the photograph in uh, 1972. And today is in the site the terrace, uh, uh, many pictures, and there is uh, Clemente Orozco. It was the uh, the Hombre de Fuego, the Man of the Fire, and he uh, is allegory of the sun. Uh, there is a view the um, uh, Instituto Cultural Cabañas, and we see the Osa Mayor uh, make to Matthias Geritz. He is the um, Alemán, born in Alemania, and he make the Via Láctea and uh, 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 the uh, big beer. And the monumental sculpture complex in the Ciudad de Mexico. Riva Palacio, as minister, was a person that uh, developed the main observatories in Mexico City that are now uh, unfortunately are destroyed. This is from Mazatlan, that was voiced by popular singer Luis Miguel. And I think that we are ending. Okay. Hey, to Ruth and Monica for your presentation. Thank you. So now we're going to the last presentation of this session. And I think that Cynthia is here. Hi. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Great. Yes, I can hear you perfectly. Can you share your presentation? Meanwhile, yes. I'm going to present it. So Cynthia Duran is going to present Tiemperos. Meteorological specialists from the pre Hispanic indigenous cosmogony of Mexico and the use of technology to promote astronomy and atmospheric sciences. So, Cynthia, you have your 10 minutes. Thank you. So, good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm really happy to be sharing this topic with you all. It's a subject that I've been developing for the past couple of years, or past three years, maybe. 
Uh, um, first of all, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Cynthia Duran. Um, I'm not a scientist, I'm not an astronomer, I'm an artist and a science communicator. So my approach to this kind of subject, it's not going to be uh, in the theoretical way or in the uh, research way. It's more about the experience that I have developing these kind of projects with working with my own uh, artistic uh, development and also working with the communities. So most of the projects that I've developed in the past years involving science and astronomy or uh, this kind of multicultural science approaches are involved with history, with documenting, with heritage, but most of all with inclusion. Because I have, I have come to the conclusion and I've realized that most of our works within even arts or science have to be in a way involved with, with the communities that we are a part of. Only, only because I, I, understand, I have to reach the conclusion that I have to, we have to understand that the more we try to work with the community and the more we realize that we are a part of the community, these sort of projects tend to, to grow and tend to have a, a strong approach and to, to the people that are actually taking part of it. So to me, these four things are very, very important to what we do. So about this project is called the Emperos. Uh, during 2018, I, I, I carried out an investigation on the request of good rain rituals that take place year after year in certain areas of central Mexico. From that initiative, I developed an educational model in a prototype weather station that could be designed and built and adapted to the, need, to the needs of each community, considering the traditions and teachings of the local Tiempero. But what is a Tiempero? Uh, Tiempero is a person, is a figure that here in Mexico uh, we have uh, from uh, a long time with the pre-Hispanic um, cultures that is someone who has the knowledge of the water, of the sky and the air and the wind and that has a responsibility to the community to perform the necessary rituals for the request of something that they call a good behavior of the sky. So I, I started developing this project around Guadalajara, Mexico, which was Durruti is uh, talking about. And my first approach to this was building these weather stations because I was trying to, 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 come to, a, to come to an objective that I thought that there was a relationship between the society and society's behavior with, uh, how, with the relationship that we have with landscape, with weather, and of course, the sky and astronomy. But, I, but when I started uh, installing this, these weather stations and, and started working with the communities, my project realized that it had to change. At some point, uh, I, designed it, I designed the weather stations and, and believing that the data that the weather stations were giving me and the data and the numbers that I was getting was enough for me to understand what the communities were doing and what the communities were behaving. But when I started uh, working within the communities and when they started helping me uh, gathering this data, designing the, the weather stations and working and talking to them, I realized that the data and the numbers were definitely not enough. So um, I spent a couple of years working with these communities, but there was one community in one municipality in Jalisco, Mexico, that is called Tonalá. Uh, this particular community changed uh, something very, very different for us because at some point we realized we have to work together with the communities. Um, it, it was a surprise for me because of all the communities that I've been working on, these people, uh, the, the adults and also the children were so involved and were so excited about the project that I was developing and the things that I was talking about like whether the, the sky, the clouds, the, the, the landscape, the stars, and, and the cosmogony of, of what I was trying to do with, with the pre-Hispanic knowledges, they started telling me what they have to offer as well. So they, 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 they told me about this um, ancient um, ancestral barro bruñido technique that they use for their artwork. And I started working with a local artist developing a new weather station that was not only electronics, but was also um, a kind of a, a piece of art 
um, developing uh, together with this Angel, with Angel Santos, which is one of the most uh, important local artists here in Mexico. And then, and then one of the this beautiful exercise that, that we did with Ruti de Alba uh, was a sky observation club with some uh, Tastuanes kids. So the Tastuanes kids, you can see in the pictures, uh, these kids are, are wearing this mask. This is because these kids participate in a, in a very long tradition that the Tonala people took place every year. It's a religious tradition, but it's also a, an indigenous tradition that they dance uh, to commemorate a historical event in this in this region. So they dance with this mask and they do um, a huge um, um, festivities all around the, the town, but the kids also participate. So one of these exercises was, uh, uh, the first part of it was that the kids would, uh, would teach me about their traditions, about why they dance, why they think it's important, why this religious, um, uh, tradition and approach was important to them and how that made them feel part of the community. And then I, uh, Duruti and I uh, were talking to them about astronomy, about the weather, about uh, the location of the of the Tonala town. And it was really, it was amazing because you realize that one of the things that make them be interested in this subject was the, the fact that it was not us showing them uh, new knowledge. It was um, more of a share, a parallel uh, knowledge between them uh, teaching us about what they do, about their dances, and us sharing the, our curiosities about these guys. So I, I developed this project around uh, 2018. Now the next part of the project is, uh, is, uh, is, is kind of the same, developing these weather stations. But right now I'm interested in working only with women, with the women that live in towns near the Popocatépetl volcano. Uh, the Popocatépetl volcano is uh, in the region, central Mexico, next to Mexico City, one of the most uh, important, uh, like in the cosmology of the indigenous culture, is a very important uh, landscape for, for rituals. So um, most of the towns around it has people has timperos, organiceros, the people that are the representatives from the from the sky to do these rituals. So there are very there's a lot of people and mostly women that has a lot of knowledge to to work around these subjects and they're developing this, these rituals every year. So my pro, my next part of the project is to try to the, to work with these women and in a way that they these women will teach me all uh, all of the these ancient traditions that they use, not, not in a way that I will go and, and tell them about astronomy, is mostly me trying to learn from them. And then uh, together we will be developing this, this uh, better and more improved weather stations, but it will be designed, the, the, point, the point of all of this is that they will tell me how to design it so that they can have data that they will use in their communities. Why? Most of us uh, have learned uh, in um, most of us have learned that knowledge and that the approach that we have uh, usually comes from from the, an oral kind of way, from a talking kind of way. Uh, some of the most of the these towns around the Popocatépetl volcano talk in talk in Spanish, but also talk in Nahuatl. Nahuatl is, uh, is, is the second most important language in Mexico. Here in Mexico, we have 69 languages that are spoken through the entire country. 68 of those languages are indigenous and one is Spanish. We are among the top 10 nations with the most native languages within 364 linguistic variants. So, yeah. yes? Uh, one minute more, okay? Okay, thank you, thank you. So um, one of these approaches uh, involves talking in a, in a different kind of, of, of way, trying to understand why the language is so important. And I say this because the indigenous tradition, the observation of the stars and the nature are part of this philosophy that includes their language. When I started learning Nahuatl, I realized that I had to try to to learn not only the words or translate what I knew in Spanish or in English, 
but I had to learn a different way to think about. In Nahuatl, you can, you can talk about the sun as a verb. You can talk about the stars as a verb. You can be the sun, you can be the sky. So that kind of approach means that not only is, is the words that they use, is how they think and how they compose their own words and their own phrases. So it's a relationship very close for, they, for them with the sky, with the nature, and how do they perceive themselves as a community and what, what goes around them. So, I, I, so one of the things that I'm trying to do with this kind of projects is not only trying to get the scientific knowledge and the technology that I use in my projects to the communities, but mostly I'm trying to, to get involved with the communities so that I can learn to, so I can learn from their culture and, I, and they can teach me what they're trying to, to represent in their own uh, cosmogonic uh, approaches. So I think that's it. Thank you. Okay, great, Cynthia. Thank you for your presentation and congratulations on your project because it seems to be quite amazing. So I think that we are a little bit late, but we have some time to answer some questions leave. So first, let's start with uh, Steve. Steve, are you there? Yes, yes, I'm here. Okay, great. So I have a question here that it says from Walter Guevara Day, uh, have you been able to fully decipher the operation and information that the Intihuatana that is in Machu Picchu provide? And actually uh, the, the, the situation there is I've gathered great uh, uh, data and um, have uh, analyzed it, but to fully decipher, no, because it's uh, still a point of great discussion amongst uh, a number of scholars with different ideas. Okay, and then I have a couple of comments for you, Stephen. It says that if you have any kind of material for education purposes, uh, then if you can put a link there or or not. Maybe... And, I, and, I, and I did respond to Rosa on that, and that. Uh, there is nothing that is di directly linked right now, but it would be my pleasure to start assembling that material for the kind of use okay. that she's talking about. Great. And the other one is that if you can't link in the chat uh, to your online courses all, also. And I did do that. Um, okay. And... Well, you do your homework. Great. <laughs> Well, next question, I think it's for Duruti. And uh, it says from Nicoleta, in the Jesuit complex in Guadalajara, is there a room with a meridian lane? I know that you have already answered that, but maybe you can share a little bit more, Duruti. Oh, yes. The, the ancient uh, Jesuit uh, college of uh, San Juan Bautista was destroyed in the 50s of the past century but we still have the the the, the transit that is frozen and seems a beautiful telescope uh, unfortunately is the, the question that uh, here uh, astronomical heritage is not well recognized in guadalajara we are in the instituto de astronomía y meteorología from the universidad de guadalajara uh, in the only uh, buildings that from 19th century still in function in, in all Mexico, uh, uh, devoted to astronomy and in this case also meteorology. Okay, great, thank you, Duruti. And I think that uh, a last question, or maybe also a comment from Alejandro Lopez to Silvia. See, it says, uh, First, excellent work, Cynthia. And then, do you know the work of the Mexican cultural astronomers in this subject? For example, Joana Broda? Yes, definitely. Joana Broda is one of my main <laughs> topics of research. She is one of the most important uh, history researchers about these matters here in Mexico. So definitely she and, and some of their, their team are one of my main uh, book reading weekly. Okay, great. 
Then I have an also a comment for you, Cynthia, that is people that want to connect to you and collaborate with you and also with all the other presenters that I suggest you leave your links to contact uh, with you and try to collaborate with your work. Uh, so I think that here we should stop with this.